Ladies and gentlemen, our program will now begin. Please welcome the CEO of the Churchill Club, Karen Tucker. Thank you. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to the Churchill Club. Our program tonight is called Disrupting Automotive Transportation, The Road Ahead. We have an incredible audience in this room. It's filled with bright, driven people who are all working to create the future. And to us tonight is a great example of a great Silicon Valley tradition where bright people get together and they exchange ideas, they meet one another, and they make things happen. We also, of course, have a diverse, impressive group of speakers here to share their thoughts, what they believe is important today, where they think things are going to go over the next decade or so. Uh, and, but before we welcome them to the stage, a brief introduction to the Churchill Club, a nonprofit in its third decade with the mission to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. We convene up to 40 events every year, presented in a variety of interesting formats, but no matter the format, we always promote authenticity, leadership, and lively conversations about what's new, next, not widely known. There are three main things that we ask of our speakers. One, please make it about the common good. That means please don't pitch. Uh, two is deliver fresh information. That means don't repeat what's been said elsewhere. And three, please give us news we can use. And we translate that into actionable insights and takeaways. And there's really a fourth thing, too, because we want everybody to have a great time. Churchill Club is now 7,500 members strong, and we invite you to be a member and get closer to the extraordinary experiences that we have here on a regular basis. If you are tweeting, please use the hashtag Churchill Club, and you will find other Twitter codes in your printed programs. And then finally, we are extremely grateful to our partner and sponsor, Shell. Shell is a great partner to the Churchill Club for years now, and we really could not have done this event without them. So please give them a warm thanks along with me. Let's now call up our speakers. Let's start with Mark Platchon of BMW iVentures. Tilo Kozlowski of Gartner, J.J. Youngworth of Mercedes-Benz R&D North America, Carl Hedrick of UC Berkeley, and our moderator, Damon Laverance of Jalopnik. Welcome. Thank you so much for spending your night with us tonight. Good evening. Um, this is a panel I've been looking forward to since it was originally pitched to me, gosh, three months ago now. Um, and we've got some really great panelists for you. Um, these are people that are focusing on the future, focusing on not just what's coming in the next year, but in the next 10 or 20 years. And I'd like to take an uh, opportunity to introduce themselves, give us a little bit of background. So start with you, sir. Hi there. I'm Mark Platchon from BMW's iVentures Group. Um, when BMW was starting to work on the iBrand cars, which you've all seen marketed now, the swoopy i8 and the little i3, um, they, they also were looking sort of big picture at what's going on in the world. And if we're going to sell cars in Shanghai and Lagos and the mega cities of the world, um, we better think about how the car fits into society. So they wanted to start, the, the car guys are amazing. I mean, M3 designers can design cars. But they don't know much about the ecosystem around the car or the disruptions happening in the ecosystem around the car, charging, parking, traffic, connected car, autonomous car, all that kind of stuff. So they started, they want to start a venture group to look after sort of all that stuff that's external to the car and part of the ecosystem. And that's what our job is, and it's kind of fun. My name is Tilo Koslowski. Good evening, everyone. It's great to see a lot of familiar faces and some of you that I haven't met yet. I met a woman earlier who has no shoes. I, I saw that right there, so we may have to get some, some shoes for her. You know? <laughs> but great, great to meet you, too. <laughs> but um, you know, my, my job at Gartner is I lead the automotive practice for Gartner. So I founded that in 1997. 
in Silicon Valley because I had the vision back then that ultimately cars would be very different from what we think about today what a car really represents. And with that, even the entire ecosystem of companies that makes up this automotive industry. That could be you know, an oil company, a show company. It could be somebody else who will take on a much broader role going forward. That was our vision when we did this a long time ago. And today we work with pretty much all the car companies in the world, technology companies, large and small, government agencies, consumer electronic companies, insurance companies, anyone who has an interest in this broader automotive theme. And we call that actually the era of smart mobility. And we'll talk more about this as well. But it's really fascinating for me to see that Silicon Valley in particular is really driving, pun intended, a lot of that change going forward. And that's just fascinating. I'm sure we'll talk a lot about it's this today. Little Detroit. Well, I, I don't even want to use that term. So the, thanks for bringing this up. I'm sorry for taking it. So second. it begins. Because when I started good. doing yes. this, a lot of people were asking me, hey, why don't you do this in Detroit? Why don't you do this in Munich? Why don't you go to Tokyo and do it? And I said, no, that's exactly the wrong thing to do. Because I think this is very different, what's happening here. This would be very different to the entire established automotive industry. And I think we're getting very close to that point. Again, we'll, we'll probably talk much more about this. And, you know, I come from the automotive industry. I used to work for Audi prior to working at Gartner. So I definitely don't think it's going to be exactly <laughs> the automotive industry going forward. But we'll, we'll chat more about that. JJ? So I'm JJ uh, Johan Youngworth. And uh, I'm here in the Valley now since almost six years. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a Mercedes-Benz research and development uh, uh, facility uh, here in Silicon Valley, and uh, we just moved into a new uh, place actually in uh, Sunnyvale, 72,000 square feet, uh, about 160 engineers and designers working hard on the future of your uh, next generation cars. And uh, I'm sure Tilo is only here because uh, we opened our lab actually in 1995. He probably looked at us, you know, from Audi saying, hey, if these guys are there, you know, we should probably also open an office in 1997. Um, and um, yeah, I'm looking BMW forward to followed right behind as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, looking forward to tonight. I'm uh, I'm convinced actually that uh, the automotive industry will see more change in the next 10 years uh, than in the last 50. And uh, hopefully we can touch on some of the the cool uh, points uh, which will will drive this change. Please. I'm Carl Hedrick from the Department of Mechanical Engineering at UC Berkeley. I've been in the autonomous systems, automated systems area for 25 years or so. When I first came to Berkeley in about 1988, Berkeley and Caltrans had this project that was leading toward an automated highway system that uh, blossomed into a national consortia um, led by General Motors to develop an automated, in fact, blueprints for an automated highway system. Uh, we had, in 1997, we had one of the biggest demonstrations. In fact, I think it still is the biggest demonstration of automated systems. Uh, even since then, it's the largest. We had cars, we had buses, we had trucks. We had everything was automated. Uh, but I'll, I'll try to maybe come back to it later. There's a huge difference between automated and autonomous. Uh, that was an automated system. There was, there was nobody else on it. It was a devoted uh, right-of-way you could get out there as like a subway system, except we had cars. If you have to mix humans and, and systems that have it and systems that don't, it's a, it's a real big problem. So I'll try to talk more about what autonomous really means. It means that they're able to act in the absence of humans. Automation means that they can just do like, like an elevator that takes you from the first to the 30th floor. That's fairly easy. Uh, doing it autonomously without having a human anywhere nearby for cars is what maybe we'll talk more about tonight. And just so you guys have a little bit of background on me, uh, several years ago I was talking to Car and Driver and Road and Track and Motor Trend, and uh, they were like, hey, we'd like to have you come out and, and start working. And I said to them, uh, yeah, that'd be, that'd be awesome. I'd love to be there. They're like, great, you can either move to Detroit or L.A. And I went, no, 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 I don't think you guys get it. We've got every major automaker and uh, several upstarts that are doing the most interesting things in transportation here in the Bay Area. This is where the stuff that's really interesting is going on. So I'm still here. Um, and uh, so I, I kind of want to get this conversation started, actually, uh, with JJ. You know, you and I had this conversation. You just brought it up again about, you know, more changes taking place in the next 10 years than we've seen in the automotive space in the next 50. Can you kind of extrapolate that a little bit more for me? Yes, so I, I see multiple areas uh, which will drive actually this change. Uh, the one is the digital space. And since the Silicon Valley is actually the, 
center of the digital revolution. I mean, all of us uh, probably were very impressed with the iPod in 2001, uh, with the iPhone in 2007, with the iPad in 2010. Uh, it really changed our lives. And if you add the cloud, if you add uh, basically all the intelligence, the analytics, and so on, and variable technology, and, and, and contextual um, you know, awareness, and uh, a lot of this basically ecosystem around all of these devices uh, and how we live our connected life. I really feel this is you know, probably um, one of the biggest drivers of this change, uh, you know, including the whole ecosystem and what's outside the car and around us in this digital environment. And then the other one is, of course, autonomous driving and automated driving. We'll talk more about it, uh, which is an enabler. On the one hand, you know, we'll, of course, be able to change your lives uh, in the next uh, few years. And if you want to, uh, you know, basically drive autonomously from A to B, or at least, you know, starting on the highway. We started this actually last year uh, with Stop and Go Pilot on the S-Class, the E-Class, the C-Class. We tried to democratize this technology. Um, which is actually awesome that people now, even in stop and go traffic, you know, they can basically uh, take their hands off the wheel and uh, basically um, let the car do the work for them. And there are a few, few other drivers, um, but I think these are the main two. But those are the original ingredients. So when you're talking about 50 years out, what are you, what are you saying? <laughs> uh, 50 years out uh, is very far out. <laughs> So, well, let's reel it back uh, to that 10-year time frame we talked yeah, about earlier. But, um, I mean, what I see within the next 10 years is uh, that we'll definitely have, ca have cars which drive autonomously um, within certain scenarios. We started with stop and go pilot, so that the, but at least within stop and go traffic, you know, you can let the car basically do the work for you. Uh, next, we'll go to the highway. And by the end of this decade, uh, basically by 2020, we'll have a highway pilot. So that when you get on the highway, you push the autopilot button and uh, let the car take you all the way to the next exit where you want to drive. And uh, on the digital side, of course, it's already here today. It's just about integration. It's about you know, partnering with these giants here from Silicon Valley with Apple and Google to bring in CarPlay and, and Android solutions and so on uh, to you know, enable people to, to continue their digital lifestyle in the car and not have to think about, oh, I need to finish this now because I'm getting into the car and basically my life stops as I'm getting into the car. And, and this is actually a quote from one of the digital natives. We asked how they think about cars today and what they are expecting from us. Well, and, 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 and that actually blends in well with what I wanted to talk to uh, with Thilo, Thilo is the fact that you're very fond of saying you know, the car is the ultimate mobile device. Um, but it, it, it's kind of lagging behind with you know the devices in our pockets, and, and we, this has been discussed for years. You know, there's a there's a massive discrepancy between an automaker that puts out you know takes four, five, six years to develop a vehicle, and what we've kind of grow accustomed to when it comes to our our, our digital devices, where we upgrade every year, every two years. Um, you know, that discrepancy has been there for a while. Do we see that changing anytime soon? So, yeah, and, and, you know, before I jump into this one, I want to just uh, build on what uh, JJ was talking about because I'm actually even more aggressive. So JJ said the next 20 years will provide more change than the last 50 years. I actually say the next 20 years will provide more change to the industry than the last century did because I actually think what's going to happen is, is that the business model will be challenged in the automotive industry. The idea of owning a car and selling a car and making the money at the point of sale, I think, will change. And there's a good scenario and there's a bad scenario to this. I'm answering your question. So, yeah, I've been using this term, you know, the car becoming the ultimate mobile device for probably eight years now. And if you think about it, you know, for automotive engineers, that's sometimes something they don't like me to say because it's more than a device to an engineer. It's a car. It's complicated. It has wheels. It has to function you know, in all kinds of temperatures. But at the end of the day, most consumers see it more as a device. It provides them some value, and hopefully it will do what we call digital lifestyle convergence. It allows you to continue with all the information needs that you have. But to Damon's point, you know, the problem is this disconnect, long product development cycles in the car versus what you do on a consumer device, which might be updated every six months. Now, I actually come to the point over the last couple of, of months that just updating a consumer device every six months doesn't necessarily mean it's getting better, right? So that's something else we have to keep in mind. I think that's kind of slowing down on its own. But of course, the car has to keep up. But I take a, a different point of view on this. I do believe that the automotive industry will figure out how to make this right going forward. And I actually believe it's not only the coolest, the, the ultimate mobile device, it's going to be the coolest mobile device in about 15 years from now. 
because that's the good scenario. If the automotive industry does everything right that we're talking about here, then hopefully that will become the most immersive, most um, fun experience that you can have, consuming content, creating content while you're driving or being driven inside of an automobile. Because I have all that real estate in front of me. I can have the coolest projection modes. I can have all kinds of touch surfaces that I can actually interact with that you can't do on a mobile device. And that is the greatest opportunity from my point of view for the automotive industry. So I do believe we'll figure this one out. You see companies like Audi working on this. We can update modules over time to keep the car fresh to some extent from a content perspective. I don't buy the argument anymore that I've heard for over 15 years in the industry, which is almost 20 years now, which is, you know, we can't do this. It's too complicated. It has to be automotive grade. A lot of the stuff has to be automotive grade in the car, but not my little screen inside the vehicle that connects me to the outside world. There are other ways of how to do this right. But I do believe that the auto industry will crack the code on this. And again, I think all of you will actually see that the car will become cooler than even the best tablet that's out there today. And that's the opportunity for the automotive industry to recapture interest from younger consumers that today are just disconnected from automobiles. Let's face it. Um, so, you know, autonomous vehicles, we might as well just jump into it now, because everybody's champing at the bit to talk about it anyway. You know, a lot in the news recently, particularly obviously with, uh, with Google Spray into it, um, you know, we've seen the Volkswagen Group working on these projects for the better part of a decade now. Um, and then just today, which I thought was really interesting, a, a company uh, based out of here uh, released a uh, $10,000 upgrade. <laughs> Basically, Bruce. mount this big sensor onto your car. Um, computer in the back, uh, actuators on the steering wheel, acceleration and brake, and you more or less have a semi-autonomous vehicle for ten grand. I don't think I'd buy it yet. I've been talking to the CEO today. He doesn't. He's not convincing me very well. Um, <laughs> but uh, but you know, I, I actually want to uh, kind of go back with uh, Carl here for a second. Can you kind of give us a, a, an understanding of kind of the evolution of how these systems have come to come to fruition in, in the last say twenty years? Well, I think when we were doing the automated highway system, <clears throat> we had to develop a lot of the subsystems ourselves. Uh, <clears throat> I think today, 95% uh, of these subsystems are in the car. The Mercedes S-Class has all of the capability. So in terms of automation, we're there. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think of autonomy, it's which is the book. big step we need to debate. I, I can see three levels of autonomy. I can see one level that I call the engaged pilot, like in an aircraft. You have all these subsystems, autopilots, and the pilot has to stay awake. He has to use his sensors. He has to take over. He may even take over without being asked. And so I think the technology is there to do that today. I can see it being on the market within a year. Uh, there has to be some you know, legislation and legality and that, that sort of thing done. The second level, I think, of autonomy is the disengaged pilot who can sit and read his newspaper, he can check his email, he can watch a movie, but he has to be on call. And as I understand it, there's a United Nations rules that's floating around. I understand that Germany and, and Europe is very supportive of this, which, which says that the driver can take his hands off the wheel as long as he is willing and able to take over at any point. Uh, and so that's the second level where the driver is there reading a paper, but he can spring into action. If the system gets in a situation uh, that it doesn't quite understand, it says, hey, human, wake up, let's go. Uh, so the beer cooler can't be next to him, basically. Right, right that's there. right. I understand, yeah. And I think the third level is the absent pilot, where the, you don't even need a human in the car. I can send the car to pick up my kid at school, uh, and then it'll, it'll bring him back to me. That's a big leap for me. Uh, that's, that's the leap that requires, I, I would say that my first level can be ready next year. The second level of the disengaged pilot, maybe five years. I think the absent pilot is going to be 15, 20 years before it's developed. But I think all the subsystems are ready to go with most of the manufacturers. Well, and, and, and I think this is something that, you know, there's been a lot of things written about it, but the larger societal implications of this really haven't been addressed very much. You know, we, we hear, you know, we have 33,000 people die every year. This is going to eliminate that. Um, even just basic vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle communications could put, it, put a really big dent in that. Um, but, you know, I, the, Mark, I, I'd like you to chime in here just because of the fact that, you know, there, there's such a broad amount of implications with this. Yeah. Um, both from just normal commuters coming in from sub suburbs uh, to even how we're going to reshape our cities in the future. And, and kind of how that's going to play out. So, like you kind of. Well, we're we're actually uh, kind of 
promoting a little project within the BMW Ventures Group. We talked about this just a little bit. Um, to, to try to envision what all this means uh, for society and for our s cities. Um, let's see, a few examples. Um, $200 billion a year is what the U.S. drivers spend just on car insurance. What a useless waste of money. Um, if, if, I mean, you know, people always want to ask, so when two cars, when two autonomous cars have an accident, who's at fault? You know, I'm not too worried about that issue. But the important issue is they don't. Um, you know, the, the safety aspects of autonomous driving are, are going to become pretty evident. Um, we've got a company called Peloton where trucks close follow behind trucks and get the safety benefits and the fuel efficiency benefits. We're going to see um, cars that basically are much, much safer than trusting people to drive. You'll be an irresponsible parent if you buy a 16-year-old daughter a car that can crash. You just won't. Um, so, so the question is, if you free up, you know, if the car, if the insurance industry, instead of being a two hundred billion dollar industry, which is based on loss rates, only becomes a twenty billion dollar industry, we have ninety percent of the accidents don't happen. What do you do with one hundred ninety billion dollars to remake streets, mass transit, to pay for the costs of all this autonomy? Um, you know, that's just one example. I was talking to somebody the other day who said, well, you know, let's think about Uber. I mean, I met my first person who traded in a 5 Series and said, I'm not buying another car. I'm going to use Uber. It's cheaper. Um, so uh, that's not a great thing to hear, but <laughs> we're hearing it more and more in the cities. Um, but he said, I'm going to go the next step. I'm going to convert my garage into an Airbnb. And make, not just make money by not having a car. I'm going to turn my garage. And so imagine there's um, approximately 75 million garages. Um, imagine how many student apartments or low-income dwellings that creates. Um, it's a pretty amazing change. Particularly in San Francisco where I don't think anybody can really afford to live there. Either. Right. Yeah. So, so, I mean, you, you start to take apart, um, you know, freeing up parking, 500 million parking spaces in the United States, the land area of New Jersey. Maybe that's a good use in New Jersey. But, <laughs> you know, that's, that's um, you know, we don't need all that. So, so there's some pretty, you know, when you really start to chase the money and chase the space and chase the insurance um, and chase behavior, you really start to see society could change in pretty fundamental ways. Well, and, and just to kind of just to pull you in a little bit more here, you know, we hear a, talk, a lot of talk about mobility, right? And it's just this really, it's just a bandied around word. It, it, it's, it, it describes so many different things. Um, how are we describing mobility today? What, what, what's your idea of mobility in, say, the next year and the next 10 years? Um, you know, a, a lot of the focus on mobility or mobility management has been to try to reduce traffic. Um, but that's sort of gone the wrong direction. I mean, people want to be where they want to be. They want to get there without sitting in a three-hour traffic jam or taking any risks of safety and, and all that. So um, I think we're actually going to have more transit, more mobility, more convenience in getting around um, and, and suppressing traffic is the, the wrong direction. It's smoothing it so it can get through. Um, autonomous cars increase the capacity of a road dramatically, and if you strip away the need for parking, cars are used 5% of the time. If you use your car an hour a day out of 24 hours, that's 4%. If you could, if you make autonomous cars, and they even have a duty cycle of 50%, they run around for 12 hours doing something useful, and then they sit and rest and charge and get fixed the other 12 hours. Um, you know, you don't need as many cars. Now, my BMW guys don't want to hear that, but it's going to happen. Well, and, but 
I, I think it's interesting. We've got a gentleman that used to work for Audi. Another gentleman's working with BMW. Another gentleman that works for Mercedes-Benz. And in all of these cases, these are all luxury brands here in the U.S. It's a little bit different in Europe, but these are luxury brands in the U.S. You know, with all of these technologies, um, and, and I think cruise control or ABS, you know, analog braking system, would be a prime example. It debuts, and then it eventually filters down to the rest of us peons, right? We, we, we finally get access to this technology. There's still this massive divide when it comes to even some of these basic autonomous vehicle systems, when I'm talking about adaptive cruise control and that kind of thing. Are, are we going to start seeing this stuff come down to the consumer level quicker now? The, the pace of innovation, the pace of, pace of the uh, development of, the, of these electronics has gotten so much quicker? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm fully convinced as we you know, basically took down the technology, including the stereo vision camera and so on, from an S-class to the E-class to the C-class, uh, and we took basically, when you look at all the sensing technology and, and the sensors in the car, we put standard equipment now even in an A-class and B-class, uh, our smallest vehicles, the compact cars, uh, which we sell in, in Europe and, and other countries. Uh, we just brought the B-Class electric drive actually to the United States. Uh, there we have actually a radar, also uh, standard equipment uh, to at least have collision avoidance, uh, standard equipment. And uh, when you look at you know, where we started with autonomous driving, uh, it was even before 1997, you probably remember and know, uh, in 1994, 95, we had the first S-Classes actually driving between Stuttgart and Paris on the Autobahn uh, fully autonomously with camera uh, sensing technology and, and uh, we had to shelve it for some time basically for you know 15 years or so because society wasn't ready and the whole legal infrastructure and system and so wasn't ready and uh, it was strongly recommended to us that just the time wasn't right. So we shelved that and we used of course the same engineers and resources to develop uh, Distronic and Distronic Plus and uh, you know, basically we brought that to all cars uh, and the same will happen now with the stop and go pilot and I'm convinced when we go the next step to the highway pilot and then the parking pilot, if you think about 30% actually of all the traffic within the cities is just wasted because people search for a parking lot uh, or for a parking garage and uh, now we think actually that can be solved and can be addressed, you know, much, much better with autonomous driving uh, vehicles. So there are so many, let's say, um, use cases and so much freedom which we are getting. And at the end, we're getting time back. I think all of you, you know, would appreciate when you drive, you know, especially you commute in the morning and at night and for all those times, you know, where it's just boring, uh, having to drive yourself, having to pay attention to yourself. If you think that you get all of that time back to be productive, to talk to friends, to talk to family, uh, or, you know, do video conferencing, Skype, uh, FaceTime, whatever, uh, with, with colleagues at work, or have your car, you know, be your uh, cinema, or have your, uh, basically, uh, car be uh, a, a music theater, or anything you want it to be in that moment in time. I think that is huge, and that will actually drive a lot of completely different, you know, innovation and a whole new breathe of companies. And I think many of these companies actually are here in Silicon Valley or will be established here because this is the place for this kind of revolutionary and, and really kind of world-changing innovation. Well, and Theo, I want you to jump in here just because I think there's a lot of, <clears throat> there's a disparity between, let's say, challenge or just kind of the expectations and the realities of this. I don't want you to, you know, uh, do you want me to clean it up? Okay. I do, <laughs> please. <laughs> um, no, but, but I think we, we talked a lot about these you know, potentials that are coming out of this, and we spend a lot of time thinking about what will happen to society once we get there. So I, I definitely believe that we'll get to the point of where we have self-driving cars much sooner than most people realize. I think all of us here are more optimistic on this than a lot of other people are, and I think that's, that's correct. But I also believe that these assumptions that we have, what the impact will be, are pretty much based on the fact that we're thinking about where we are today and what the impact will be from this new thing. I actually think that maybe this whole concept of cities and living, having to live in a city will go away if you have a car that drives itself. Think about what that means to real estate prices. If all of a sudden I don't have to be in San Francisco because I can actually be somewhere else and the car drives me up there and I can be productive during this time. So there's some really fundamental challenges and impacts that could actually really kind of tear apart that fabric that we take for, for granted today and how we assume things will continue to move in one direction. Um, I just want to also share with you one data point, you know, since we're talking about how realistic this is. Um, consumers are pretty ready for this as well. 
And it's not just premium car buyers. As a matter of fact, you could argue it's actually going to be the ones that buy volume brand vehicles that might more be interested in this. So let's do a poll. Let's see who's ready. Before we get there, before we get there, right? Because I just want to make that point because if you think about it, if I buy a BMW or Mercedes BMW or something else, I probably are somebody who wants to get a nice car and also for the driving characteristics that come with that car. If I have to push a button to have the car go in autonomous mode, maybe I will be forced to push the button because the government tells me to do it. It might not be up to me anymore going forward. I lose that appeal, right? And it might be those consumers that really are looking more of, for means of transportation that are more open to actually push the button and get in any of their cars, even smaller vehicles and, and lesser brands or volume brands. So Nissan is working on a lot of stuff. Volvo is kind of a premium brand in between a volume brand is working on a lot of stuff and a lot of other car companies. But we found um, that you know, 38% of all, 39% of all U.S. vehicle owners from a study that we just did in the United States say they want some form of autonomous driving in their car, 39%. And, and mind you, those people have not experienced a self-driving car. Right? So once they experience it, they might actually be even more interested in this. It means, though, also that 60% aren't quite there yet. And the majority of people that aren't quite there yet say they're not there yet because they don't trust necessarily the computer or they don't want to lose control to a machine. And that's my concern, too. Not that I have an issue with computers and that I think they go haywire and crazy on me, but I want to be the one who decides when I want to do human driving or autonomous driving. And I'm just concerned that once we get to that point of where the technology is sophisticated enough, the government or the insurance companies will tell us, no, you are going to drive in autonomous mode. This is, going to be great. this is terrible. <laughs> no, I, I'm not going to the, the places where you can actually go and shift the car and drive a car and start an engine and drive on the track are going to be a huge growth industry. <laughs> Because you can't do it on the road anymore. <laughs> See, I like to still do it on the road. So, and, and I think there's some of you out there that like to do that too. But point well taken. So for those of us that actually like cars, like to drive cars just for fun, and I think there are a lot of them actually here in the audience, I honestly tell those folks, go and get the dream car now. Because in 10, 15 years, it might be a very different future where you can just decide whenever you want to drive that car. Because keep in mind, at the end of the day, we have a privilege to own a driver license. It's not your right. It's a privilege. And that privilege might be redefined going forward by governments. And I can tell you I'm having some discussion with governments around the world that are beginning to look into this. The Vienna Convention you know, that, that mandates all of the rules in terms of how you actually drive and operate a vehicle is looking into how they change their laws in order to enable driverless vehicles at some point in, in between self-driving cars. So we're getting to that point. It is pretty real. Consumers are ready. I think the technology is ready. And I think we'll even figure out the legislative aspects of this. So I think it's going to happen. And the elephant in the room isn't in the room. Because guess which car company just hired BMW's top autonomous car guy? Tesla. Well, you know, that's, that's one of the companies, right? I mean, let's keep in mind, everybody is working on this. I don't think I want to call out anybody in particular. No, but, but Diamond has done a great job you know, demonstrating some yeah. of these capabilities, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that actually kind of parlays nicely into something. You know, what are we looking at as far as kind of the economics and implications of this? Um, you know, I think there's been, there's been a lot of fear-mongering when it comes to, oh, taxi drivers are going to be totally out of business and, and uh, you know, we're going to be concerned about roadway development and that kind of thing. Um, I mean, you've been following this for years. What's, you know, what, what do you think are the biggest red flags in this area from an economic implication point of view? Yeah, you know, economics is not really my strong suit. Um, but there are things you guys have considered, obviously, over the years, right? Yeah, it's, it's clear, just like in all forms of automation. I mean, this is what hit the automotive industry when robotics entered the manufacturing workplace. There's a shift in the skill. And a taxi cab drivers might be out of a job. I hadn't really thought of that. But if Uber can come around and pick you up without the driver there, uh, hopefully it'll be a shift uh, not the elimination of all jobs, but a shift to more skilled jobs. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't have too much to say besides that. <laughs> Mark, do you want to jump in here? You know, um, I, I spend, when I'm not doing BMW stuff, I look at other areas that are being disrupted, and education is being disrupted, and they're starting to teach coding literally in elementary school and high school almost as another language. We've got a lot of people we need to retrain to be coders. Uh, I mean... Companies like Code HS and stuff are, are I mean, we're going to, we, the world's changing. We need coders. 
not, well, not taxi drivers. You know, and, and aside from the societal implications and, and, and worldwide and safety and all these other things, I, you know, I think the thing that really gets me excited about autonomous cars, and this is coming from a guy that you know, rides a motorcycle and loves to drive, is just we're looking at a totally different paradigm in design. Right? We, we can rethink. And what we were promised when electric vehicles came out was, look, get a battery mount underneath, four wheels. We can do whatever we want with the interior to a certain extent. And what have we seen? We've seen the same car designs that we've seen for the last 100 years. So you know, from a design perspective, and JJ, I'm sure you can kind of elaborate on this a bit more, um, you know, f from not an exterior design. I think exterior design, whatever. I, I don't care anymore. Interior design seems to be one of the most interesting things to me and kind of how we're going to reshape the inside of the car is to, to kind of keep up with this new system. So, yeah, this, this is actually a very, very big uh, topic as well. And I've been working with Gordon Wagner, our head of design for Mercedes-Benz. And uh, we established actually about two years ago an advanced user experience design studio here in Silicon Valley, uh, in our Silicon Valley R&D center. And uh, in the meantime, actually, the whole digital design if you look at all the digital real estate in an S-Class, which has a full digital cockpit with a two 12.3-inch displays, now we added an, uh, a head-up display, and uh, all of this basically combined with uh, you know, the ambient lighting, uh, with uh, uh, the scent, and, and all of that, it creates an experience, uh, and it all needs to be basically designed and, and, and engineered and basically user experience design is becoming as important as interior design and exterior design. So for 127 years, basically, we focused on exterior design and interior design only, but now we need new skills. We need, and we are actually hiring, and we have been continuously hiring since, you know, about two years ago, um, user interface designers, user experience designers, and they actually uh, come out of universities with a completely different mindset, with a completely different, you know, skill set. They have been maybe designing, you know, gaming consoles or uh, web interfaces or, you know, basically other digital user experiences in the totally past. this is a totally new environment, and it's not something that's taught in schools, you know. Yeah. Um, the, the automotive grade, you know, kind of large buttons, easy, you know, muscle memory, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's a totally different device than, say, your iPod or... Or, or, or a smartphone. So, how are they? Are, are they able to keep up with these kind of designs? Actually, I think. Yeah, I think you need the baseline, you know, in order to do digital design, to do software design. But um, you know, as Steve Jobs already put it, you know, basically design is not just how it looks; it's also how it works. And uh, in my opinion, it's the right thing and the right decision, at least for us, for Mercedes-Benz, to have this user experience design studio here in Silicon Valley. Uh, because here you have the mindset, you have this, you know, creative uh, talent pool and, and also a different, basically, look at, you know, how, how users actually, you know, basically interface with uh, consumer electronics devices and uh, then how to adapt this, you know, into, let's say, this environment of the car. And that it's just a short period of time where we really have to, let's say, take care of the self-driving mode and, and, you know, AAM guidelines, minimizing driver's distraction, all of that. You know, as soon as autonomous driving, we talked about before, is there as an enabler, you know, now these guys can actually all, you know, do what they really want to do to create a digital experience where you can be productive, where it can be fun, where you can just basically bring in all this, you know, digital information and all this, you know, these layers of digital information around us as the car drives, you know, through the environment. There's so much information out there available digitally, which we cannot show today because it would be too distracting. But if you think about your windshield becoming a uh, head-up display, all your windows on the side, actually the car is you know, the perfect augmented reality space because you have windows, you have glass basically, uh, which could be OLED uh, glass uh, between you and the environment. I mean, there is so much uh, you know, which is possible technologically and also I think very, very useful and I think people will appreciate as soon as all of this you know, develops and this, at, this, at this point where people can use it all. But we're doing it all backwards, I'm going to argue, because uh, you do the same thing we do, which is all the newest, coolest, highest tech stuff comes in at the top of the line, at the S class or the 7 series, and we measure how do the customers, who average 60 years old for those, React to it. Now, actually, I and then it trickles yeah. down to the millennials who buy a one series or a three series, 
you know, a few years later. Actually, instead, we, we got to go introduce the high tech, crazy, advanced, expensive stuff at the bottom. No, that paradigm's already shifted because you're, I was yeah. going to say, you're bringing up CLA, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, exactly. Please. I mean, uh, in 2012, we changed this around. When we introduced our, you know, iPhone integration, which was the world's first integration based on a smartphone where the smartphone was the heart of the solution. Basically, you know, with OpenGL and, and high-end graphics and the GPU and the CPU, basically the, your, your iPhone driving your experience in the car. So all the pixels on, you know, the digital screen in the car, everything, this whole experience with social media and places and so on, your whole digital life in the car was all driven from the smartphone. And we introduced that in the A-Class first at Geneva Auto Show and then B-Class, CLA, uh, now GLA, so we really went the other way because we felt all of this is really important, especially for the millennials and especially for those customers which come in from, uh, from the bottom. So I think in this regard, maybe we realize that this is important a little bit quicker than BMW. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me say one thing. You, uh, you asked me to, to sort of give some historical context to things, and I was thinking in the 1970s, uh, General Motors had a project they called Project Trilby. And Project Trilby was to say, they realized that electronics was coming along, and they were saying, let's not think about a car as an engine that has some electronics on it. Let's think of a car as a computer that we have to move from A to B. And they set up a huge building. I mean, it was a 300, 400 people operation. <clears throat> it was not successful. And I think it was just because there were no Apples or Googles or anybody else to, to sort of realize the potential of this. And... Project Trilby only lasts maybe five years or so. I forget how long, but, but they were clearly too soon. And I think you know, that's, General Motors has done that on several occasions. Yeah. So. Um, you know, getting back to interior design, you know, I, I think we've gone from knobs, or I should say we've gone from switches to knobs, buttons. Now we've got touch screens. I know you had a hand in developing one of the first, yeah. funding one of the first at least. So what's, what's going to be the next great like, paradigm shift for interaction? Like, is it going to be gesture controls? Is it going to be, like, what, what are we seeing coming down the line that's actually going to be both sci-fi and feasible? Right? See, I, th I think it's going to be a combination of different technologies. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to give a consumer the choice to choose whatever they want. If it's more voice-centric, then let them have the voice. If they want something that's more touch-centric, that's fine, too. But I think there's another dimension to this, which is context awareness. That's becoming almost a new element in how you design certain instances going forward. And I don't want to overhype this. We have been looking into context awareness for over a decade now. And you have to have a context broker in there. You have to, it's a really complicated model if you really want to do this right. But we'll definitely see this and it will become table stakes, to be honest. Everybody will have that capability going forward. But that's one of those dimensions that you have to start thinking about more. And you're just talking about delivering the information you need exactly when you yeah, need it. Yeah, right? pieces of information. Right? So yeah. I always say instead of internet browsing that all of us do on devices today, in the vehicle, at least today, as long as you have to drive the car, it's going to be internet snacking, right? Pieces of information that are served up to me so that I can consume them when I need them. And, and you create a very immersive experience in terms of how you do this. That's definitely a part of this. But I want to see a, almost a, a kind of a, a toolbox that I give consumers that they can pick and choose the right UI and user experience for them when they're in a car to consume and create and share digital content in the same way that I can specify today if I want a leather or cloth interior. That doesn't exist today, though. In most cases, I get one solution, and I better like it, or I'm out of luck, right? So it works well for companies if they have one standard system that they always offer. So, for example, every time I go on, on a business trip and I get a rental car, I typically get a BMW because I'm used to that system, but only because I'm used to it. That's the only reason I'm doing this. And there's a value in doing this. It's not necessarily the most immersive experience that I would like to see, and it might be even somebody else who would come up with that experience going forward. You asked about earlier, you know, what are the implications from a design perspective when you have a, a driverless car or, or, or autonomous vehicle? You know, we might see, and I'm jokingly saying this, that IKEA will become an automotive supplier going forward, right? Because they might give you the furniture that goes inside the car if I don't have to worry about the steering wheel. Maybe you get, a, in addition to a spare wheel, you have a, a spare steering wheel going forward that you have to pop up you know, and put in there if something goes wrong in the system, right? So you might see all kinds of weird scenarios going forward, but I honestly believe it might be even different companies that will actually address how you create very compelling user interfaces. I hope, going back again to that hope that I have for the automotive industry, that the car companies will lead with that stuff going forward. But it might be somebody else, at least for the majority of companies. 
I, I'm just shuddering to think about building my own car interior. That sounds awful. With those little <laughs> Allen wrenches. Oh God. Um, you know, this we were talking about contextual information earlier, and, and I, I live off of Google now, right? So when I was due here this evening at 5:30, my phone pinged me and said, "Hey, you know, you got to leave in 15 minutes," which was my indication to get in the shower and get the hell out of the door. Um, this brings up the biggest issue that seems to be facing at least kind of the younger generation, and we kind of discuss it with A-Class and CLA, which is the fact that, you know, the pace of consumer electronics is moving so quickly, so rapidly. And with these development cycles taking so long, you know, what, is there a silver bullet here where the automakers can finally start to keep pace with, um, with the consumer electronics world without requiring, let's say, and, 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 and Mark and I were talking about this the other day, was the fact that, you know, <clears throat> Am I going to go into a BMW and they're going to go, oh, you use an Android device. That's not going to work. You have to use iOS, right? So are we at this point now where we can finally break out some of the, um, uh, the infotainment portions, which I hate that word, but the infotainment side from the normal vehicle development? Yes, in, in my opinion, uh, definitely. I mean, in 2012, there was no other you know, solution and standard out there. Uh, to enable you to bring in your smartphone and to just work. It was just Bluetooth and it was just, you know, basically the, the, the very basic use cases. But uh, we had to develop our own solution at that time. But now, 2014, I'm actually very happy to see that um, Apple basically is launching CarPlay mm -hmm. and it will just work uh, in all of these cars out there which support CarPlay. And with that, we have already, you know, a big step towards decoupling, you know, these cycles. So as long as we ensure on uh, the vehicle OEM side, and this is working in premium uh, vehicles as well as in mass market uh, vehicles, basically all brands which open their interfaces and their displays uh, to interact uh, with and, and allow, you know, the CarPlay uh, data and, and user experience to come up on their screens. Uh, and it works with touchscreen, it works with knobs uh, or command controllers in our case. And uh, that's a big step forward, and uh, we we'll be have seen, seen something similar from Google yeah, this week. Have, in a couple of days, to mention, fact, yeah, yeah, OAA announcement in uh, January at CES, and that's definitely uh, a big step in the right direction, uh, including Mirrorlink, and you see Microsoft activity in, in this regard. But, so there will be at least three standards. To, but are automakers willing to see control? That's the major thing that I keep hearing over and over and over again: is the fact that you want to maintain branding, you want to maintain all these things. So we, we actually see this very differently. I mean, if you are an Apple customer or you are an Android customer and you are in this ecosystem, let's say CarPlay because it, it's there today. Uh, if you are an, an iOS or iPhone user and uh, you want to continue that experience in the vehicle, feel free to do so in a Mercedes. Uh, we appreciate that and we, we actually think we should let the customer you know, continue their connected life and meet them where the, you know, meet the customers where they are. And if they are used to, let's say, the UI and the music uh, application, for example, from uh, uh, iPhone, including uh, iTunes radio and so on, and even the icons are the same, you know, and how you search your music and so on, and then with Siri. So that means that experience as uh, it is, you know, on the mobile device, on the smartphone, outside the car, it just continues seamlessly. And if you have done a search in your uh, Apple Maps, and you enter your car, it's just there. You don't have to do it again. Well, we so, all expect it to just work now, and it just hasn't happened yet. So, oh, basically, that's just a matter of a few months, uh, you know, <laughs> for for the solutions to be available. But that's definitely very important. Now, to the contextual awareness, I just wanted to add one comment because I think many of us, you know, got used to our cars now having all the sensors, you know, for let's say rain sensors for your wiper control or light sensors to have your lights turn on automatically at night or when you drive into a tunnel and so on. So we automated already so many, let's say, uh, actions which uh, you, know, you had to do manually before. And with this contextual awareness and, and with basically bringing in machine learning into the car, which is really big in the valley too, and I think it's going to be a big, let's say, technology and enabler to help us solve some of these problems and automate even more. If you think about you know, maybe not here in Silicon Valley, but in most other regions of the U.S. or Europe where you have winters, actually from November until February, March, maybe April, whenever you get into the car, you have to turn on your seat heating manually. And if you drive five times per day, you, you five times per day, you push the seat heating button. This is crazy. 
you shouldn't have to do this. You know, the car should just learn this as you get into the car. You know, the car recognizes you and it recognizes, you know, the environmental data. It knows basically your temperature uh, settings. It knows, you know, your seat heating, whether you like it on position two or three. And as long as all this contextual information and the contextual data is the same, it can just automate basically a lot of this, of, of these, you know, very little, you know, action and, and it amounts to a lot of distraction even today. And if you, if you take this further, if you think about you get to your car, the car already knows where you want to drive. The car knows what music you want to listen to. The car knows what temperature settings you like, your ambient lighting settings, your you know, seat heating and steering wheel heating and armrest heating and all of that. And, and you know, if you think that all of this can be automated and not just in your own car, but when you take a rental car, you will probably take brand X because uh, that's where my profile is set up and this car recognizes me and sets everything up the exact same way I want it, uh, you will likely take that brand. And when you take your next car, you will likely stick to that brand. I think it will drive customer retention actually with a brand because it's going to be difficult to just change ecosystems. I mean, if you think about if you have all your photos in iPhoto, if you have all your music in iTunes and so on and so on, in this ecosystem, it's going to be hard to switch ecosystems. I think a similar thing will happen in the automotive industry. Maybe if I can just add to this, you know, similar to how JJ talked about this, I think what you will see before we even get to autonomous cars is going to be that we'll get to self-aware cars, which is exactly what uh, JJ described. Cars in the future will know what happens inside the vehicle and outside it, and based on this, can automate a lot of things for you. So that's another term to, probably that you will hear more about. That's what we call self-aware vehicles. But to your point about, you know, when will we figure out this disconnect between consumer electronics and infotainment, uh, I, I definitely think, too, that we'll figure this out. It's just a question of time. To me, actually, infotainment almost is done as a category. I'm not worried about that anymore. And I do believe that ultimately a lot of the content from an infotainment perspective will be owned by the big ecosystem companies out there, Google and Apple. We'll have this week more announcements. If there's a single car company out there that believes they can actually own the navigation space going forward, boy, you're going to be in for a surprise because that is done. That, that part is completely done. And there will be other categories that will be occupied and owned by others. That means, though, that if the automotive industry wants to really lead with this, and, and I would even challenge what you said, Damon, Damon. Um, you know, it's not about like catching up to the consumer electronic industry. I actually want the auto industry to leapfrog this and be faster than the consumer electronic industry. Why not? If the computer companies can get into the car, why can't the automotive companies go outside of the car? And I think there's real opportunity to do that. But I think that you will see the car companies then having to focus on those things that they really are good at and that don't necessarily occupy that infotainment piece. That means mobility innovations going forward and really starting to think of how you can leverage the engineering expertise, the manufacturing expertise for outside of the automotive applicable areas. And I think we're just barely scratching the surface. That's when we get to what I call the Internet of Cars, which is, of course, part of the Internet of Things. But I foresee, at least for some car companies, a much bigger role than just on the infotainment side. That, that's done. But you were raising the question of can we even get these cars to get all this new stuff. I mean, we're, with very few exceptions, we have very few cars that can even update over the air. One. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, when I, I, I adopted that as my, I'm sort of the sand in the oyster at BMW. Um, you know, I adopted that as my issue. Why can't we do over the air updating? And first I was told it's illegal. Then I was told it was impossible. <laughs> we update the Hubble telescope. Give me a break. Um, yeah, but and, that's one. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's a and then they said, actually, the dealers won't let us. Because uh, the dealer wants us to come in and manually update the software so that the dealer can, get, can figure out what else is wrong that they can charge you for. Um, and, and so how do we, you know, and so, and that so, so I push that yeah. issue. I push that issue, and uh, I'm sure JJ will correct me, but, you know, our cars today have t roughly 22 computers in them, one that controls the locking and one that controls the seats and one that controls the air conditioning and one that controls the sunroof, and each one is so underpowered and incapable of doing anything except its little assigned task, 
and then we buy each one from the cheapest supplier, and then we got to make the one from Delphi talk to the one from Conti to talk to the one from Panasonic, and we cobble together something that barely works, and then we freeze it and say, that's it. And so we're you done. can't over it. And the reason they explained to me that you can't update it over the air is between eight different car models and 47 different variations and 10 years of legacy you have to be reliable on, you can't possibly do that over the air. And that's true. You can't. For now. For now. And so they said, we're too small a company to own our own software base. So we have to get all these black boxes with their own secret codes in them and then make them talk to each other. I said, but Tesla has their own software base. Yeah, but they don't have legacy. <laughs> <laughs> which could be, which I'm going to say is, A, a really good place to shoot to Q&A. Um, but B, that's the blank slate, right? Right. That's really what we're talking about. But, but everybody's working on that, right? So it, you're right. I mean, it's frustrating. But everybody's working on software updates. And again, even consumers like the idea because nobody wants to go for a little you know, tweak that they have to, to make to go to the dealership and have to put up with all the, the other stuff that goes along with that. But in the defense of the dealers, and I'm not defending them a whole lot, but Don't in defense of the dealers, yeah, yeah. let me tell you, <laughs> if, if there's a problem on your car, you're, you're happy if you can actually drop it off and get it fixed, Right. Because it's one totally different story if you have 100,000 million cars on the road that all of a sudden have to be actually transported to someone. That's, that's a hassle, too. But that's as far as I defend dealers at that point. But you know, to the point of you know, what we do with technology, you would see all the car companies do this stuff. And it's complicated. This is new stuff for the industry. And, and you will never always be able to update everything remotely. And it's probably, again, a good thing. Because once we have IP addressable cars, which we're going to get to once we have fewer components and modules in the vehicle. There's some security issues with that too. There's some safety issues. This isn't trivial stuff. And I'm sure that none of you guys would like to have the convenience of over-the-air software updates with the risk that something could actually be hacked into. Right? So that's something else that you have to keep in mind because at the end of the day, that's a physical device that drives you at a very high speed that can kill you. So it has a very different dimension than some other you know, device that we all are used to. Shall we? Um, we'd like to open up to audience um audience questions right now. We've got a few people running around with uh, mics, so thanks for getting the lights up. So you talk about uh, leapfrogging some of the uh, activity that's going on in Silicon Valley. Maybe it's not quite a leapfrog, but Apple has uh, introduced a fitness interface to the phone as the car looking towards maybe understanding the biometrics of the people in the car and being able to say, I'm driving you to the hospital because you are going to have a heart attack in three minutes. Yeah. Is that, yes. is that it's happening. Is that it's actually happening, right? So car companies are, are working with universities on this to actually see how the, the, the seat that you're sitting in, or even cameras looking at you, plus you know, anything that you touch can become sensors that actually measure your, your health state, even your awareness state, for that matter, right? So yeah. people with diabetes, for example, could be driven to you know, a place where they can eat something or, or get whatever they need, insulin. And, and they're definitely already, uh, there's work on the way to do this going forward. And that's quite frankly where I see the opportunity for the car, that it becomes that ultimate mobile device that actually takes care of me. In the same way that a car takes care of me today if I get into an accident, which hopefully none of us will ever get into, with airbags and all of the other stuff. It's not really far-fetched, right, to think about that the car then does even more like this. But I, I want to even go beyond the vehicle. Why don't car companies become home security companies? going forward because, again, they take care of me. They provide security inside the car. The car for many people is like the fifth, sixth bathroom, right? So why not extend that outside of the car to something else, other assets, other environments that we live in? I think that's where some opportunities are coming from too. There's a great little company just came out of stealth in San Francisco called Vigo that makes a, a little um, sensor that looks, it actually is a Bluetooth headset, but it also looks at your eye blink rate and can tell if you're starting to fall asleep. And they're going to mandate it for truckers if they're successful. Because um, after all, in the last few weeks, we had a Walmart truck and a FedEx truck both commit accidents just because the drivers are falling asleep. The sensors should be able to tell you that and wake you up. Yeah, and we, we started a few years ago, actually, with the attention assist. We brought that, actually, to all Mercedes models, uh, which does that so that it actually uh, lets you know when you are about to, to fall asleep and then a little coffee cup comes up and uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, 
depending on your reaction, you know, uh, you might get also some audible tone so that you make sure that you, you basically get a break. And uh, the next, next step is sensing technology for other health information. Um, and we are heavily working on, on that. that. That space actually is uh, definitely an innovation field for the next few years. And, and, and honestly, the, the wearable thing was actually something I wanted to get into. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many, how many people are wearing some kind of wearable device right now? A lot of Fitbits I see, a couple of Google Glass, that kind of thing. It just seems like such an obvious growth area right now for us to get into. It's, if you can link up with the car, whether it's Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, it seems like a really obvious application. So, uh, Next question. Um, thank you very much for all the very, very interesting information. I feel like you took us all on a trip to the future. So when I heard this uh, cup, uh, coffee cup popping up and like the disruption on a, uh, on a, a real estate market, I thought like, okay, so were they gonna be like also a disruption? Like my imagination went a little further and like, were there gonna be like a disruption also in movie theater market? Cause maybe we will watch movies in a car. So there will be like, instead of screen sheet, there'll be just like screen and then, you know, curtains will fall down. And then instead of AC or like some, some close to AC will have like a hot popper and then popcorn will be done. So like, you know, a great, great lap into the future. It was fantastic to hear. Um, but I also feel that we all in Silicon Valley, we live actually in the future. So I came to Silicon Valley only two years ago. So I see that it's like much, much ahead. So I just wanted to ask a question about this 39% of people who are ready of, for autonomous, uh, some kind of autonomous uh, driving car. Can you expand a bit on it? And uh, what, like, I'm really, really surprised to hear that there's such a high amount of people that, that have trust in energy, in, in, not in energy, but in a car and self-driven car that would like to actually use it now. So, so yeah, I brought up this number, right? So, and, you know, there's a lot of more information behind this. So that's 39% of U.S. vehicle owners that say they're interested in some form of autonomous driving. It doesn't mean that they want this to be on all the time, which is really important, right? And we actually differentiated this, you know, between autonomous driving just on a highway versus just in cities, you know, under what speeds, uh, environments, and so on. And there's some differences. But overall, people are pretty open to this. But keep in mind, that's 39%, which for something that people haven't experienced yet is very high. But it also shows that there's a lot of hype associated with this. Plus, it does show you that 61% say, nah, not really interested. Right? So if we really want to go mainstream, we have to convince these other 61% to get there. We ask those people as well, you know, why not? And it is the, the lack of the, the loss of control that they really are concerned about. And then it comes the trust issue. You know, do I trust that machine in front of me? And, and I tell everybody, if you haven't been in a self-driving car, I have been in pretty much all of them at this point, it takes you 30 seconds. My first experience was in a, in a Volkswagen that you know, parked itself, which is mundane compared to being on the highway, and then I was in a Google car. And it takes you 30 seconds to feel comfortable, right? And I love cars, so my, my reaction always that I share with people is, I had almost tears in my eyes thinking that a stupid computer can do what I thought I only can do, right? And I think a lot of people have that same kind of uh, experience. And then the eye-opener was that somebody was cutting us off, and the car was kind of really relaxed, backing off, and letting that car cut us off. I would not have reacted like this. None of you would have reacted like this, <laughs> right? So that, that shows you that there's a real benefit to this. But at the same time, and it's funny, on my way up here, I actually had one of the, the Google cars in front of me for a pretty long stretch. At the same time, though, if you have a car that drives always at the speed limit and always follows the rules, that's not that cool either, let me tell you. <laughs> you know? and, and that's why, you know, when, when Google made the announcement about the car, this prototype that they have now that can drive 25 miles an hour, yeah, that's not going to be good for, you know, adopt, adoption and, and good feel about autonomous vehicles because if you have that car in front of you at 25 miles an hour in a 35-mile zone, you will hate autonomous cars going for it, right? So... You have to be very careful, but you know, consumers are definitely open to the idea, but we aren't quite there yet, but it's encouraging. Next question, please. Hi. Uh, my question is, uh, for autonomous vehicles, do you think the acceptance of autonomous vehicles would be much larger if we have one software installed across all OEMs, or you would like to have different autonomous softwares for different manufacturers? So activities like what Tesla did a few months, a few weeks back, opening up its patents on electric cars. Do you think something like that kind of activity happening for autonomous cars could facilitate or speed up the activity? So uh, uh, if I may take this question. Uh, if you look at it, of course, from a uh, 
competitive standpoint, uh, let's say as Mercedes-Benz, uh, AMG, Smart in our case, uh, of course, since we own this software actually for all or most of our driver assistance systems, our intelligent drive uh, controller, we do most, if not all of that software programming and so on in-house because we have a competitive advantage. Um, uh, due to that, and I know, of course, competitive advantage is always temporary, so it needs, you need to keep innovating and so on and, and drive the future uh, and not wait. So um, I think, um, you know, from today's standpoint, uh, I think we wouldn't be interested to share our code and share, you know, all the algorithms. It's really, really tough to develop all the situational awareness, uh, all the, um, you know, decision-making algorithms, uh, all the, uh, you know, even control software and so on and so on. Um, so I think for some time at least, until the competitive advantage is gone, you will not see this being shared. But I wouldn't say never, uh, and in that regards, uh, you know, as we at least are interested within our brands and our car line, you know, from A-class all the way to S-class, to have this technology available throughout all models uh, and really having kind of a democratization of this technology, um, you know, at least through the supply chain and other companies like Continental and Bosch and so on, which are very active in this field as well, you will see a lot of the technology um, and, uh, you know, enabling software and so on be distributed throughout all brands. Now, you had this initial question about the trust and would, it, would the adoption be quicker um, and, and the trust in the technology. Um, I am I'm not so sure. I mean, I think so far you really, you know, didn't see that this makes a difference whether, let's say, the cruise control or the Stronic Plus or whatever you call it, or adaptive cruise control um, software is coming from the same supplier or the same company or not. You will see the same standards from operating system or software perspective when every cell phone has the same operating system, which probably won't happen in a long time, right? It's because I think that's a competitive differentiator. That's the magic sauce, right? That's not going to happen. But I do believe that probably testing procedures for vehicles at some point will be standardized for autonomous cars because people have to feel comfortable about this, and it can't be all over the place because somebody has to regulate this, and the government will probably look into this from that perspective. Very good. Next, please. There was a mention of an elephant not being in the room. Another elephant not in the room is General Motors. Uh, could you comment on what the implications are for all of the things we've been hearing about ignition switches and millions of cars recalled for this whole discussion? Ooh, that's a tough question. I, I take it because I work with GM, right? But um, it's a good question because you can see that if something goes wrong, from a mechanical perspective, in this case it was mechanical, but now try to you know, think about what that means from a software and data perspective, that things can get really ugly, right? And I do believe that this is something that has to be bulletproofed before we see these things on the road. And I'm worried about that anything that would kind of bubble up and become a big issue would actually tell the automotive industry to, be, to continue to be risk averse and not to push the envelope, rather than saying, well, we have to fix this as soon as possible you know, in, in typical Silicon Valley mentality, I guess I, I say throw technology at this problem. If we have something that doesn't work well, technology has to figure this out right away, rather than, you know, people having to experience this and then talking to a dealer that then talks to the OEM and so on. So technology could be the solution. But I'm worried about that these issues will ultimately slow down the innovation. I hope it's not going to happen, but this is what we're dealing with. This is a car that actually has people in it that can be very dangerous. So that's why I want to highlight this. Over the software updates is one example. We'll see this, but we have to be very careful how we do this stuff because you know, lives are attached to this stuff. Next, please. So uh, I guess before we have the car that we can send to a school to pick up our kids and bring back, what do you guys think that I've read about having sort of autonomous grocery carts that just comes from your local Safeway at 15 miles per hour, bring it to your home, it's well mapped out, no accident issues. I'm sure it's going to make a lot of us very, very happy not doing it. So we'd love to hear, before we get to that, can we get to grocery cards that are autonomous? Yeah, if, I, if I may answer that one, because I think that's a good one. Every good time one. you have a predetermined route that you can take, it becomes a little bit easier, right? Because it's more of a controlled environment. And the first kind of instance of that would be if you have a car that parks itself in the parking garage. You just drop it off at the bottom and it just goes and finds its own spot and comes and picks you up again. 
But the, um, the, the Netherlands, so the, the Dutch Ministry of Transportation, just last week made a decision that they actually want to move forward on making trucks autonomous and creating legislation around this for exactly that purpose because they're hoping that it becomes an easier challenge for them to do actually this kind of stuff. There's still issues associated with that, but um, you know, I think we'll see some of that before we actually have every consumer being able to have a car like that. Please. So what I haven't heard at this point is taking cars, making them small enough that they'll actually fit on larger vehicles. The real problem we have here in Silicon Valley is tremendous traffic. I get to go against the traffic all days, but I get to see a mile lineup every morning from getting from 237 to 101. I think what we need to do is to reduce the number of vehicles, have high-speed mass transit, and have small vehicles that get you the last mile, the last two miles, and I haven't heard that kind of discussion. And then that would lead to something that says perhaps what we'd have to have is a base level of operation that makes for safe interoperability because what you'd want to do is to have these small vehicles all fit into some large standardized vehicle. It's called a bicycle on a bus. Bicycle. Um, I've even seen, for example, an electric skateboard. Um, uh, Rhino has a one-wheeled motorcycle. There are a number of different vehicles for this, and uh, I think we have to think about this as a solution. And if we don't do something like this, I'm not sure the traffic problem is ever going to go away. You definitely would see this, and you would see even announcements exactly on this subject um, in the not-too-distant future. We're really discussing intermodal transportation, right? Yeah, it's intermodal, but it's also you know, the idea that we have maybe completely new concepts of vehicles going forward, right? Because I still believe that people want to have a, a vehicle of some sort where they're protected inside. They don't want the bike necessarily, right? Even though you know, in certain parts Electric of the world, bikes. like Copenhagen, yeah, there they use a lot of bikes or the Netherlands, but not necessarily here. Quite frankly, I think it's dangerous to be on a bike in, 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 in most parts of the U.S., but you will see new car concepts being launched that are much, much smaller. Everybody's working on that, too. And it's difficult, though, to find exactly the sweet spot that consumers want to have, plus to meet all the safety requirements. But the problem with all of this stuff is, and I don't think there's an easy way around this, that you have conventional cars today on the road, and whatever you would introduce would have to actually co coexist with these conventional cars. And if you have a small little pot you know, that you sit in that is very environmentally friendly, but you have behind you a big Escalade, that doesn't pay attention because the person's on the phone, I don't want to be in that small car. And I don't think you want to be either. That's the problem. But I, I would add one thing, and I, I agree with you in terms of the missing public transportation. I think this is uh, especially the case here in the U.S. And um, I think what, what we need to see uh, in, in general, actually, in the U.S., we only have one mega city, which is New York. All of these other major metropolitan areas, you know, like Boston, Miami, Chicago, San Francisco, LA, and so on, are all mega suburbs. So people actually don't live in the cities. And our society and technology group, they look at this actually and study this, and we can see by zip code all the growth and where it happens. It's all in the suburbs. So that's where actually all the growth happens, and uh, just very, very minor grow growth around the city centers or so. So that means the car is you know, still king in the United States, and, and if we think about adding another 20 million or so on population until 2030, it's a market of France or, or the UK. And um, I mean, I think it's, a, let's say, a good thing for the automotive industry, uh, and, but also mainly because public transportation isn't solved, and I don't see it being solved in the next uh, 20 years. So people need actually a car to go to the grocery store, to uh, go shopping, uh, to bring their kids to school and back and so on. And um, likely, you will see, let's say, within the, you know, basically the, the car space that autonomous driving and, and having, you know, cars then driving themselves and bringing people from A to B or doing, uh, you know, certain, um, let's say, or taking care of, of certain uh, to do, so to speak. Uh, but there is actually one, one study out which shows that there will be fewer cars needed eventually when autonomous driving vehicles actually would be fully out there in, in the market because a car can actually drive you to work and then in the meantime can take care of, you know, maybe bringing uh, the kids to school and your wife to some other place or spouse or, uh, and so on and so on. So in total, we will see a reduction in vehicles and there have been even some percentages out there based on some studies and simulation. So I think actually you would see fewer cars being owned by us but you will actually see more cars on the road at a given time. I actually believe that going forward, all these technologies that we talk about 
will make it even more difficult for public transportation. I think public transportation will become even less relevant because these cars will allow you to get wherever you are in your own little environment because the technology is enabled you to do that. Yeah. That's we, what we actually tell governments too. Yeah, we participated in a, in a big survey of, of what mode of transportation would people want to use for given kinds of trips. And the, the questions were, you know, would you use a bike, an electric bike, a motorcycle, a car, a train, a bus? And there was, um, and, and there was other. And the interesting thing was more and more people are writing other, meaning I'm not going to do those errands at all. I'm going to have it delivered to me. And the pizza, does, you don't go pick it up, it gets delivered. The dry cleaning, you don't go pick it up, it gets delivered. You don't go to the grocery store and do the shopping, as you said, it gets delivered. So the winner is Amazon, not, you know. <laughs> Minus the droughts. Or, or, or FedEx <laughs> or UPS or whoever. Next, please. Over here. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, with the electric car, uh, the internal combustion engine and, and, and all the innovation that's happened with the internal combustion engine in the last 50 years just kind of gets tossed out the window all of a sudden. And now you have the self-driving car and then Google's the name that gets mentioned uh, all the time. So what does, uh, what does the car company 20 years from now look like and what are the skill sets that, that, that a car company is going to have? Yes. So, uh, if I may, um, it, actually car companies become mobility companies. I'm convinced that we become mobility providers. Maybe we don't sell cars in 20 years from now. Maybe actually we sell mobility and say here are you know, 20,000 miles per year, 60,000 miles per year, uh, and then you decide you know, how to use these miles on a vehicle type A or B or C and whether you do a combination of car sharing and uh, auto mobility or the car you know, driving autonomously. Uh, or you know, there will be still the model to purchase or lease a vehicle. But uh, I think in general, we are all moving towards becoming a mobility company uh, or mobility companies. And uh, we just announced uh, in Geneva actually just uh, uh, a few months ago, our new mobility brands, in our case, it's Mercedes Me. Uh, you could also say Mercedes Me as a verb. Uh, and uh, um, we have five sub uh, brands with Mercedes Connect Me, Mercedes Move Me, Mercedes Assist Me, uh, Mercedes Inspire Me, or Mercedes Finance Me. And all of this is basically around the car. And um, thinking about you know all of these let's say, services uh, around mobility. And in my opinion, that's very key for the success and even you know, for the future existence of, of uh, the automotive companies to, to move into this direction. And, and that's exactly why you also see other companies getting interested in this, right? Because at that point, once you become a mobility solution provider, which I agree, that's where this is all going, you don't necessarily have to own a factory to make cars. And that's where it gets a little bit you know, dicey for the traditional automotive companies versus who else will come next. I think we've got uh, time for two more questions. So, so I have a quick question. Uh, and the question is very simple. Um, I really like how my cell phones evolved in the last 10 years, but the bottleneck on the cell phone is the battery right now. I mean, I used to use my first smartphone probably for two days. Now I can use it maybe for four hours, eight hours. So I wanted to ask about the battery and battery application in the automotive industry. And there are basically three prongs, cost, safety, and range anxiety. So maybe you can comment on that. Oh, you, need a, you need a phone with an internal combustion engine that you can just refuel. <laughs> yeah. That's the solution right kick there. Because yeah, yeah. we all know batteries don't last, right? Yeah. But... Um, you know, I think that's a tough one to answer quickly. You know, um, I think in a car, again, you actually have a lot of benefits compared to the experience that you have on your mobile device because I don't have those limitations. If I take power, for example, to be connected to the outside world on your phone, yeah, after a day you have to recharge this. In a car, I don't really have to worry about this because I have no power issues because I have an internal combustion engine that you know, also powers a lot of the electronics in the car. So that's one of the ben benefits. But I would like to add one thing, though, because uh, it is definitely a, an important topic. And uh, there are you know, still a lot of, let's say, investments in uh, fuel cell technology as a big alternative to get rid of the whole range anxiety because it has you know, huge range. And uh, uh, it feels very natural when you refuel in three minutes the same way as you do today to top up your vehicle. And um, 
of course, we are working, you know, in general, I think, as an industry on still continuing to evolve and, and you know, develop new chemistry and, and technology of the future for the batteries or for the battery electric vehicle. But at the same time, you know, we are focusing on plug-in hybrids uh, and we are focusing on fuel cell. And uh, we will see. I think, you know, in, in five to ten years, a lot will happen in this space too. And you might see maybe the battery electric vehicle be more, let's say, a city vehicle which you really, you know, basically drive in the local communities and, and doing kind of the city driving. And uh, then you have a second car for all your, you know, longer uh, dri distance driving and so on, which might be an internal combustion engine combined with a battery and so on, kind of like a, a plug-in hybrid. Uh, or it might be a fuel cell uh, in the future. So we'll see a lot more you know, investments and innovation in this space as well, very similar to you know, what we have talked about in the digital and autonomous space. I'm not, I'm not ready to say we need to leave the battery behind. Um, I mean, we're seeing 6 7 8% per year improvement in battery energy capacity. Um, there's 130 companies working on energy storage in California alone. A whole bunch of those are working on advanced chemistry or technologies that reduce the cost of making batteries or pack, packs together with better battery management systems. I mean, I'm personally, and I think some of the brands are optimists on this stuff happening. Um, I was telling Damon a, a story just before this. Um, you know, once upon a time, the uh, light bulbs didn't last very long, and gas lights were the way to go. And all the material scientists working on better light bulbs were frustrated, and the gas guys said, ah, it'll never work. You know? And then somebody figured out the tungsten filament in a, in a vacuum light bulb, and GE built the first gigafactory, and all the gas ones disappeared in a decade, and the entire world went electric in a decade. And, you know, one of these companies is going to stumble on the tungsten of batteries and will have batteries that are good enough and it'll all tip over. I mean, this whole tipping point thing sort of gets lost in the shuffle when we talk about batteries. When they're good enough, they'll take over. Final question. Thank you. Um how do you see the future of fuels, and in particular fuels retailing, in this ecosystem and context that you describe? In other words, how do you drive brand and customer loyalty of an autonomous car? That's a, that's a good question. So, you know, and, and brand loyalty might be redefined completely going forward, right? Because at the end of the day, if you have an autonomous car, a self-driving car that you don't even own, then you really become loyal to a service provider, and, and that service provider has to be connected to somebody who provides the energy fuel or, you know, electricity, whatever it's going to be. So it's going to be an ecosystem that you're really getting loyal to, from my point of view. Even if you don't understand all of these pieces as, a, as an average consumer, what makes up that ecosystem. But you will trust somebody to actually manage that ecosystem for you. And that, to me, is part of what a mobility solution provider has to look like going forward. And that could be even that, uh, you know, an energy company is a big part of this. Maybe the energy company is going to be that ecosystem owner going forward. But that's where I would like to see way more um, risk-taking creativity by companies to say, yes, we want to move into that direction. Because if you don't, somebody else will. I would like to add one point. I think actually as a, as a premium OEM, we have a great chance in this regard to actually deliver a premium experience. If you think that, let's say, a premium um, autonomous driving vehicle can become your movie theater, uh, your uh, you know, music hall, uh, your uh, workplace, uh, everything you want it to be in that moment. Um, and if you think about it, you know, this, this scenario I described before, that you get into the car, the car knows you, it greets you by name, it creates this space, you know, from ambient lighting to your favorite radio station to everything you like, you know, from, uh, you know, climate control all the way to everything else. Uh, and uh, this is really, let's say, tied to a brand. This comes back to this interior design and the user experience design. I think we have a great chance that actually customers will still be tied and loyal very much to a brand because a certain brand you know, gives them this experience. And we build up a profile over time so that you, get only, that you only get this experience actually when you stick to that brand, even when you basically take a rental car or uh, you know, your next uh, uh, decision for a new vehicle comes up. 
or teleportation happens and we're a lot of work. That's right. That's fine. <laughs> anyway, thank you, gentlemen, very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate how candidly you shared your opinions, the strategies of your companies. That wasn't a pitch. Those were strategies. <laughs> and as a small token of our appreciation, we have for you the Churchill Club speaker T-shirt. Please wear it in good health. <laughs> A video recording of this program should be available within the next 48 hours, hopefully 24, on the Churchill Club YouTube channel. And if you don't know already, most of the programs that we do are available for viewing there. And um, thanks again to Shell very much. You have been a wonderful audience. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you, Chad.